Good morning, Waypoint. Welcome to our first annual online Palm Sunday service. Uh, this is a special Palm Sunday for me, honestly, because it's the first time that I can say on, on Palm Sunday, hey, I've been where that happened. You know, I went to Israel just a few weeks ago, and I'm going to show you a couple of pictures that are part of the story this morning uh, for Palm Sunday. So um, this is the Mount of Olives. Uh, it's a picture I took uh, just a few weeks ago when I was there on the, Mount, on the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus is in the Mount of Olives or on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And he tells a couple of them, hey, I need you to go get a donkey. And they go get this donkey for him. And he gets on the donkey and then he's looking toward Jerusalem. So he's, this is the view similar to what he would have had from the Mount of Olives. And so he begins to ride on the donkey. And then a huge crowd gathers because Passover is a tremendous celebration for the, for the Jewish people. And so he's riding into the city. And it's interesting that he's riding on a donkey because there were two ways you could ride into a city. One was on a horse, and that meant that you were coming to wage war. And the other is you could ride on a donkey, which meant you were coming to bring peace. And so Jesus, on Palm Sunday, uh, with people laying down palm branches and celebrating his arrival, uh, he comes in on a donkey saying, I come to bring peace to this place and to the world. And so it's just a great chance for us to celebrate this Sunday. Uh, lots of stuff going on this week, digitally and online. Uh, I'm going to invite you to look at the emails that we send out on Wednesdays and Sundays uh, that are kind of the standard emails we'll send out during this period. Uh, secondly, I want to mention to you two quick things for this week, for Holy Week. One, um, we've got a great Easter series for the kids on, on Easter eggs, and I'll just leave it at that. And there'll be a link to the YouTube playlist where you can, with your kids, uh, check out uh, Ruth uh, telling you the story of the Easter eggs. And then secondly, we're going to do a Holy Week devotional where uh, I'm going to just do some quick uh, videos to give us a picture of the seven last statements of Jesus, all of which he made on the cross. Plenty of other things going on, which you can, again, see in the emails. But for this morning, just want to welcome you to worship. And let's just turn our hearts to the Lord as Brad brings us some music. Normally, the week before Easter is filled with a lot of preparation for the holiday, maybe to set up an Easter egg hunt or make Easter baskets or maybe get a new dress or tie. But all that's been canceled this year, and we're going to have to settle for a simple celebration, which might not be so exciting. But really, Palm Sunday is when we remember a very simple celebration. The Jesus was coming into town and the people, yeah, they did grab some palm leaves, which were a symbol for victory, but that's pretty much it. But what they did do was they got out of the way. They welcomed Jesus in as king. Now, when baby Jesus had come, there was no room for him in the inn. People did not prepare for him to arrive. King Herod was not prepared to give up his throne to the King Jesus. But at Palm Sunday, they welcomed the king in. And so as we sing this song, Prepare the Way, I just want to ask that, you know, maybe the Easter festivities are canceled, but what it's really about, welcoming King Jesus into our lives, is still on. So as we sing, is the Holy Spirit asking you, inviting you to invite Jesus more into your lives? Prepare the way. Prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord for Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You are the king of the earth. 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 You
are the king of the earth, Jesus. You are the king of the earth. You are the king of the earth. You are the king of the earth, Jesus. 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 So, when we last saw Joseph, he had been thrown into prison by Potiphar. He was trapped in the Pharaoh's prison for nothing that he had done wrong. Suddenly, the only thing he was certain about was life's uncertainty. So today, we're going to look at Genesis 40 and 41 and see what happens to Joseph while he's trapped behind bars. In speaking with some waypointers over the past few weeks, I appreciated how one of them said how hard it is right now. Because like, if we knew how long this was going to last, it would be so much easier. If we knew that it would take two weeks, then great, this is like some extended vacation. Even if we knew it was going to take four weeks, then then maybe we could turn it into sort of a Sabbath time to recharge and reconnect as a family. Or even, even if we knew it would take six weeks, maybe it would take some strategic changes in our lives and things, but, but at least we could start to plan and prepare for something different. But what makes this unbearable is not knowing how long this would last, not knowing how much time it's going to take. It actually makes me think of Joseph and his time in prison, where he's not sure how long this is going to last. Larry Crabb, a counselor, writes that nothing matters more in these hard times. Nothing matters more than developing a passion for Christ as we try to handle life's struggles responsibly and wisely. He says, our primary purpose is not to use God to solve our problems, but to move through our problems towards finding God. You see, what's necessary in this time is taking our focus off of our problems, off of the things that are right in front of us, and getting a change of perspective, a change of focus when we take our eyes off of what is immediately in front of us and begin to see through them and the greater hope we have in God. And so would you join me as we pray? God, I pray that this message would be your word and that people would be able to see you in the midst of whatever's going on in their lives. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. See, we are people who long for hope. Tim Keller, in his book uh, about pain and suffering, talks about how essential hope is in our lives. He says to us, Keller writes in his book and says that human beings are hope-shaped creatures, that the way you live now is completely controlled by what you believe about your future. And he tells this story some years ago about two men who were captured and thrown into a dungeon. And just before they went into prison, one of the men discovered that his wife and child were dead. And the other learned that his wife and child were alive and waiting for him. In the first couple of years of imprisonment, the first man wasted away, curled up and died. But the other man, he endured and stayed strong and walked out a free man 10 years later. Keller says, notice that these two men experienced the very same circumstances, but they responded to them differently. 
Because while they experienced the same present troubles, they had their minds set on different futures. It was the future that determined how they handled the present. They were hope-shaped creatures. The way you live now is completely controlled by what you believe about your future. See, Joseph was able to hold on to hope because he had a hope in God. Verse 40 starts with, chapter 40 starts with verse 1, telling us that some time later, it had been some time for Joseph to be in prison. Some time later, the Pharaoh became angry with his cupbearer and his baker, and so he throws them down into this prison. And again, in verse 4, we're told again another time that some time has passed. See, for Joseph now, it's been a really long time. One would think he would kind of have lost hope in this situation, that some time has passed, that the days had become meaningless. I don't know about you, but I've kind of lost track of what day of the week it is, what even month it is. Is this April? Is this March? When are we? And now this is how I like to organize my life. Just to give you a little window into my soul, this is how I like to plan a week. But now, now it just feels like time. Time is kind of meaningless. Time just is passing by. So how do you stay hope-filled when it seems like time is slowly passing? When it seems like God isn't working on your schedule? Do you still have an eager expectation that God is going to show up? See, Joseph, Joseph believed God was going to do something. And so, well, after some time, the cupbearer and the baker, they both have a dream. And Joseph offers to interpret their dream form. Now, if you remember back to chapter 37, which Chip talked about a few weeks ago, it was actually Joseph's mess that started this whole thing. He had told his brother and father about two dreams he had of how they would one day bow down to him. And this infuriated his brothers. And while all these years later, Now Joseph finds himself in prison in Egypt. One would imagine that Joseph probably thinks he's actually not very good at interpreting dreams. Yet yet still he has hope. He has hope that God is at work in all of this. And so he tells the cupbearer and the baker, he he interprets their dreams for him and tells him in three days, the cupbearer is going to be restored and the baker is going to be killed. And three days pass, and everything happens exactly as Joseph said. But verse 23 tells us, I think, one of the saddest lines of Joseph's life. That even when he asked the cupbearer, he said to him, please remember me. Show loving kindness. That word is the same word we talked about last week, that chesed love that is described of God's love for Joseph. Joseph is begging the cupbearer to show him loving kindness, to remember him when he gets set free. But we're told in verse 23 that when the cupbearer comes out, he forgets Joseph, that the cupbearer forgot him. Joseph has been forgotten. He's a forgotten man. Have you ever been forgotten? Has your mom ever forgotten to pick you up from school? Were you ever stood up on a date? Or did you ever have a loved one forget to wish you a happy birthday? Have you been overlooked for a promotion? Do you feel forgotten by people right now? Being forgotten hurts. But Joseph, Joseph still remains hopeful, even when he's been forgotten. So it's been some time in prison and some more time in prison and three days go by. And now we're told in chapter 41 that 40 or two years go by. And now the Pharaoh has a dream. 
And the cupbearer suddenly remembers that man, Joseph, that had been in jail with him, and he brings him before the most powerful man in Egypt, saying, Joseph, this man can interpret your dream for you. And so when the Pharaoh asks Joseph to interpret his dream, Joseph replies, I cannot. But God will give the Pharaoh the answers he desires. Now, this this is a bold claim to make before the Egyptian Pharaoh. See, the to Pharaoh in Egypt was considered a god himself. So Joseph here is making a radical claim about a god who is more powerful than Pharaoh. Joseph interprets his dream with calmness and coolness. And he's telling the most powerful man on earth at that point. He's saying to the Egyptian pharaoh that his future depends entirely on God, not on any power or planning by the pharaoh. You see, our futures depend entirely on the Lord, not on our power or might or strategy or planning. And if you notice in all of these dreams, they've always been forward-looking. They're always making a claim about the future. Joseph's brothers will bow down to him one day. The cupbearer would be set free three days later from prison. That there would be a famine that strikes Egypt seven years after abundance. All of these dreams are making a claim that the future is inscrutably in God's hand and not human hands. Our futures are in God's hand, not our own. And if that's true, then that means there's one more powerful than me. And that's our hope. Our hope that there is someone in charge who's more powerful than me, than you. It's a hope that, is, that God is at work, even when our circumstances don't make it seem like it even when we look and see the bars staring right in front of us in our face. See, it's this hope that allows Joseph to move from the prison cell into freedom. It's our hope that moves us from the prison of our sin and death to grace and eternal life. See, hope is not wishful thinking. Like, that's how most of us use it. Like, I hope for nice weather tomorrow. Or I hope for a puppy. Or I hope Teddy Bridgewater is a good quarterback. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's an assurance. It's a claim that God's ultimate promises will come true one day. See, Joseph, despite being sold into slavery, thrown into jail, being forgotten, he still has a hope that one day his dreams will come true. And that hope is the assurance for him. It looks not at our immediate situations, but starts to take a longer view. It doesn't see what's directly in front of us, but is able to see past the bars and focus on the future. It's a change of perspective, a change of focus. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's when we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem to start Passover. It's very likely that over 2 million people would have been in Jerusalem for Passover when Jesus arrives. And on Palm Sunday at the start of the week, everyone is singing Hosanna, waving palm branches and crying out, Lord, save us. They have great wishful thinking for what Jesus is going to do, how he's going to come in and set them free from the Roman occupation. But by the end of the week, by Good Friday, that same crowd will be disappointed by him, that Jesus is not acting quick enough, that he's not living up to their expectations, that their wishful thinking has not come true. And so they start to cry out and shout, crucify him, crucify him. And when he's strung out on the cross dying for our sins, they mock him saying, who are you, Jesus? If you can't save yourself, how are you going to save me? 
See, Holy Week reminds us that often God will not do what we think he will do. But he's going to do something far greater than we could ever imagine. Hope boldly claims that if things aren't good yet, then God's not done yet. Hope means that you don't know how or when God is going to work but you have an assurance that God will do something somehow, some way for you. Hope challenges you to look past our immediate problems and set our eyes upon Jesus. This is why at Praise and Prayer each week we ask, where have you seen God at work? Where can you see him today? Can you catch a glimpse of him? Can you see God working among and amidst you? And if you can, then I invite you to join with the Hebrew writer who says, then let us fix our eyes upon Jesus. Let us focus on Jesus, not on ourselves, not on our circumstances, but fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter, the writer of this story, and the one who will make it perfect. For who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Look to him. Focus on him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. So friends, how can we look to Christ in this season and put our hope in him? For his love surpasses everything we could ever long for or hope for. Thanks be to God. Amen. So one of the hallmarks of Waypoint is what we call praise and prayer. It's this time where we ask ourselves and ask each other, where have you seen God at work? Where do you need God to work? And so in this season, we've taken to hosting Wednesday night Zoom gatherings as a chance to just share what God is up to. And this past week, we got to hear from Kathy Gilchrist about what God has been up to in her life and in her family's life. Really, I just, um, I feel blessed in this time and thankful um, to all those that are really on the front lines, the nurses and the doctors. I feel like we are able to work and stay in our house and stay kind of to ourselves. Um, But in saying that, like my niece is on the front line and I know there's so many other ones out there on the front line. She's in Seattle, Washington. and just it took her an hour just to calm herself to make a sandwich the other night when she got home and i cannot believe um or imagine how that is um either so i know all of us are praying for those on the front line but um i also just wanted to share to what's going on within our household our um where we see god working and how um even going through and listening to um, the sermon on Sunday about Joseph's story, how he was brought and bought and not in control. Um, We, um, even in that story, I, I, I was, it became apparent to me like Joseph and all of that, because he seemed like he was a man of faith and his dreams and just everything that came upon him. He, he had a response and he knew how to hold himself under it. Um, and really, even though he may not have been in control, he was in control of him, his self and how he reacted to it. Um, and so um, when this started um, 10 days ago, I first sat down with my prayer journal and I actually made a list. I absolutely know God is in control, but I believe that he puts us in situations where he 
prepares us and he gives us the means to somewhat control things under our wings. Um, and I wrote simple things that I actually could control. I can determine like what my kids hear about this and how I balance what they hear from what they can hear from the Bible and um, the biblical truth. And uh, as Wes was saying the other day, just guarding their hearts and guarding our hearts to be able to shepherd them through this time. I, I feel like God has, if, if you're in the word and you are praying about it, he prepares you and he can really, he can help you be somewhat control of things, simple things like that within your home. I can also control what news I absorb. Um, part of me, <laughs> Peter, I, I think Peter <laughs> realized last week, I'm somewhat in denial. If I don't hear the news for four days, that's okay. Like, cause I'm not going anywhere. I have food. <laughs> we are here with our families. Like, a part of that is even okay because I'm trying to support my husband in his job, homeschool the kids, and really it's not, the news is not going to help me do anything that I can do right now um, in, within this household. Um, so it's okay to protect your moods and determine um, with God's help, like the mood you set in your household. And I've also learned um, and thought about. I can control what I'm learning from this and this waiting. Um, my dad's 75th birthday was today is today. He's an April Fool's guy. And um, just how I haven't probably spoken to him every day. Um, um, you know, of course my life, but two weeks leading up to it. And today it's like, we've never been closer just because we have to have that contact all the time with him. Um, and so in learning how to reach out with people, and I think Mark Cooper said it great, like just plugging in and seeing how the people are around you. What can we be learning in this waiting? I told um, Lindsay Berry that I was not just keeping the things that God has like put under my control over this time, but I've also been writing about what I learn and learn what I'm learning and what I hope and pray I never forget. Um, simple things like my kids were completely overscheduled, period. They're four and six and I have was running them to five million sports already and just keeping them innocent. I, I pray that if they don't play another sport until they're in middle school, that's okay. Like just because I've just seen how the simple simplicity of what they've had the past couple of weeks, it's, we're just all in a calmer place. Um, and I think that the speed of everything nowadays is, is just your, it would be questioned upon me, why aren't your kids playing 20 sports? It's just, that was what our mentality has become. And now it's more, I think, um, just more of a calm. Um, as I was telling Lindsay, it's it's just, it, we were overscheduled, even as a four and a six-year-old. Um, and then I've also learned um, to... <laughs> I, um, that my husband works <laughs> when he leaves his house. I guess I thought as a stay at home mom, he was getting four Starbucks a day and like a smoothie and like hanging out downtown and having lunch. But I never really saw like all the people really, really working hard at their jobs and what they do and like on conference calls all day and and then just thinking about all the other teachers and the medical professionals and everybody now just yes stay at home moms have it like we're busy all the time but it everybody's busy and everybody has such a um, gift they bring in their profession and I, I'm thankful in this learning period I hope to meet two, three years to now to reflect that 
the cashier at the grocery store is working just as hard as I am at home. Um, and I pray that is something I learn and I take from this as well. So I thank Waypoint for getting, um, being, let me be able to share, but really, so my list and my journaling has been what God has actually laid on me that I can control and it's taking hold of my emotions and my mood of the house and also what I hope to learn in this time. And I hope to look back in two years in my journal and see, um, where God really was working on me and what I learned um, from this crazy time. Um, so friends, as you head out this day, this is the coordinates for the week. How can you look past your immediate problems to focus on the hope you have in Christ? As an action step, very practically, in order to fix my eyes on Jesus, my next step is, what's the one thing you can do? And may you know that God the Father sees you. He never forgets about you. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show us a way out of the prison cells of our lives into a new future filled with hope. And may the Holy Spirit give you all joy and love and peace you long for this day. I hope you all have a wonderful day.